one of the most important things that you can do is find a way to awaken greater appreciation every single day. And you have to meditate on it, by the way. You know, you meditate on, you know, well, how would I feel that this didn't exist? If a person doesn't appreciate their health, think for a minute, for five minutes, how would you feel if you had to be in the hospital right now? If a person doesn't appreciate their wife or their spouse, how would you feel right now if you were by yourself? And you'll see as you meditate on these areas of life with which you have abundance already, but have lost appreciation over time, you will see how much happier you are. Hi, folks. I'm really excited to welcome our guest today, Michael Berg. Michael's teachings have really had a huge impact on my own life. He's definitely one of the best teachers I've ever encountered. And he's thought very deeply about how to build a life that's truly richer, wiser, and happier, and how to achieve real and enduring fulfillment. So it's lovely to see you, Michael. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you, William. Excited for our conversation. Uh, me too. I, I was thinking this morning that your your teachings have done probably more to make me become happier than anything else I've learned in many years. And then I was thinking, I'm, I'm not sure I'm any wiser yet, but hopefully by the end of the conversation, <laughs> this is going to kick in. Well, I'd say two things. I'd say on, on happier, it, those teachings that, that, that I share are the ones that continuously make me happier as well. And I think probably the first thought that I have around this is that the only way to truly have happiness is by running after wisdom all the time. And wisdom, I, I don't just mean information, right? Uh, wisdom that that changes us, that gives us a new viewpoint on on life, on, on issues that, that we're going through. I don't believe that it's possible, from certainly for most people, and certainly for myself, to be living a life that is progressively more enjoyable uh, without a, a constant desire and, and pursue, pursuing uh, the gaining of more wisdom, wisdom that, that changes us. And on the wiser side, there's one of my favorite quotes from, from an ancient uh, Italian Kabbalist. He says that the purpose of all wisdom is to know that we know nothing. And I think it's a, it's a really important understanding that you know, it comes off as a little bit funny, but really what it means is that you can always tell the difference, and it has to do a little bit with the, with the quote that you mentioned earlier, you can tell the difference between somebody who's really wise and somebody who's not, is the humility that comes with wisdom. Because if you truly have any significant breadth of wisdom, the one obvious conclusion is that you understand a tiny, tiny fraction of reality. And therefore, that must lead to humility. So, you know, you, you, I'm sure we've all met people like this in our lives. There are those who have all the answers for everything all the time. And then there are those that have some of the answers sometimes, but always with humility. And that's uh, the attainment of wisdom. So when you say uh, you're not sure you've gotten any wiser, that's great. one great indication that you probably have. <laughs> so we live in hope. No, I, I've studied Kabbalah for about 15 years and have found it incredibly life-enriching wisdom. But I'm aware that a lot of people in our audience don't really know what it is. And, and also, it's worth mentioning that for thousands of years, people like me weren't allowed to study this concealed wisdom. So could you just ground us a little bit by explaining what Kabbalah is and how this secret concealed wisdom came to be accessible to all of us here today, including uh, folks like me, who, who would have been regarded as much too, much too ignorant and base to study Kabbalah until sure. uh, the last few decades. Sure. And so what I'd like to have, I'd like to have a little bit historically and then a little bit more, uh, um, I would say, deeper spiritual answer. So historically, the, the view is that from the beginning of time, there's always been this secret wisdom, and that's borne out through through, through uh, many of the works that have been uh, revealed that came to our world. But that's the understanding. The understanding is that this wisdom is not a new wisdom. It's a wisdom that really was the foundation of, of the world within which we live. Historically, though, there are a number of books that were that came into being. One of them is called the first, most ancient of the Kabbalistic works that we know is what's called the, the book, the Sefer Ayetzirah, the book of creation or formation, which um, was revealed you know, a few thousand years ago. It is meant to have been written by Abraham, the biblical patriarch. Then the idea is that Kabbalah, which literally means received, it was an oral tradition, not a written tradition. So even, for instance, at Sinai, a, number, a, few, a few thousand years ago, when what is called the, um, the Torah, the Bible, was, was revealed through Moses, it is understood that within that revelation of the physical, what we have today as the five books of Moses, there was also an oral secret tradition given as well. And throughout history, while there was a tradition that was, that kept teaching and giving from one generation to the next, the what's called the reveal 
Torah, to reveal uh, spiritual understandings, there was always that layer of the secret. And it was only about 2,000 years ago when a great Kabbalist in the northern Galilee, in northern Israel, re revealed to a small group of students the it was, it was called the Zohar or the secret teachings. And he asked them to start writing it down. From that moment, for the next at least 1,000 years, students of Kabbalah, students of the Zohar, would study these teachings and continue to write down and add on to them. But still, it was only to a small group of students. The teacher who had the wisdom would gather around him or his, himself, you know, five students, ten students, and that's how the tradition kept going. About 800 years ago or so, the Kabbalists believed, and there's other um, historical reasons for this, that it's time for this to be at least a little bit more revealed than just to a small group of students. And therefore, what's called the Zohar, the foundational text of Kabbalah, was really brought out to the public. Again, still only in Aramaic, so only those who understood uh, Aramaic and were able to read it were able to access this wisdom. Uh, this continued on, and uh, uh, there's a lot of history here. I won't go through all the steps of history. But basically, up until about uh, 100 years ago, you had to be a, a tremendous scholar with a connection to one of the teachers who had this secret wisdom to really access it fully. One of the reasons why the organization that I am uh, a part of today, the Kabbalah Center, came into being in, about 100 years ago was because they understood, that the, the spiritual leaders at the time, that the world needs this wisdom. And then began a process, first in Hebrew, and then in English, and then eventually in all the languages of the world, to endeavor to make this wisdom accessible to all, because it is necessary for all people. That's a little bit of the, of the history. So it's an, an ancient secret uh, wisdom that was originally held by only a few given from generation to generation to those, those chosen to receive the wisdom. About 100 years ago, or so there began, began a process of making this more and more accessible in, in other languages, and, and of course, uh, making anybody who wanted to receive this wisdom to be able to access it. The other part of this, and by the way, William, feel free to ask if you want to go any further detail into the history of it. Is that we can talk an hour and a half just on the history, but I would be, yes. Well, one thing I was going to say is it's amazing to people who don't know just how controversial this was because your your father, um, Rav Berg, and your mother, Karen Berg, obviously played a very central role in spreading this wisdom, and I. I remember when your when your mother passed away uh, um, back in 2020. You did a beautiful podcast episode with your wife Monica, where you talked about lessons from your parents. And one of the things you mentioned was that when your parents had decided that they were going to spread this wisdom, your mother was literally attacked with a baseball bat, and your father said, "You know, they'll kill us." And your mother said, "Well, that's okay. We'll be doing what it is we're passionate about." I mean, this was this was a very controversial thing in many ways to make this public. Absolutely. And the controversy goes back thousands of years. I mean, to be clear, you know, those who were teaching wisdom 2,000 years ago, especially during the Roman rule over Palestine, over what is now Israel, um, there were many teachers who were killed by the Romans because the Romans saw the teaching of this wisdom as, as, a, as so in some ways undermining their control over the people, over the country. So, one of the most important Kabbalists, Rabbi Akiva, who was the teacher of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, he was killed by the Romans for gathering around him students to teach this wisdom. And unfortunately, that has been the history of this wisdom for many, many years, where it was always seen as either dangerous, either to, again to government or to, to religion or to other people. And, and many people who, who partook of this wisdom and tried in any way to teach it, even if it was to small groups historically, would find themselves in danger. And even as you said, as we go back only 67 years ago, sorry, 100 years ago, with Rav Ashley, the founder of the center, many of the students who were uh, very learned from very, what are called good families in Jerusalem at the time, in the 1920s and 30s, they were beaten up by people around them because everybody felt this wisdom is too, too important, too secret, too holy, choose the word, for anybody to be learning it, to be studying it. It should be kept in a book, in a corner, on a shelf. And so that has been the history. It has been dangerous, literally up until, you know, relatively recently, uh, physically dangerous to be to be studying and disseminating this wisdom. And as you said, in the 1970s, when my parents began, continued the efforts of the earlier Kabbalists to bring this wisdom to a wider and wider audience, there was physical danger involved. 
Thankfully, today, I don't, I don't think that that exists, but I think it is important, I know for myself, to appreciate the fact that literally there have been people, many people, for the past thousands of years that have lived, literally either given up their lives or, or put their lives in jeopardy uh, for the purposes of bringing this wisdom to the world. And which leads me to the, to the second point that, that, that I wanted to make, which is that when we talk about this wisdom, and I think it's really important, you know, I think a lot of people have whether notions of religion or whether as it relates to spirituality, what we're talking about, when we talk about the wisdom of Kabbalah, we're talking about the, the underpinning spiritual rules that govern life, that govern our world. And when you understand it in that way, it becomes clear, of course, anybody who wants should have access to it. If if I or you, anybody in the world has wisdom information that can make one person's life better, of course, that wisdom needs to be disseminated as widely as possible. And you wrote in one of your books, Kabbalah is not a religion, but rather a technology. And in, in many ways, what we're going to discuss in depth today is how this kind of spiritual technology can help us to build richer, wiser, and happier lives. But can you first explain what you actually mean by it being a technology rather than a religion? Right. So the word has many words, even the word God, but the word religion has many different meanings to many different people. It has a positive and negative history, as most of us know. The understand the Kabbalistic understanding is that when you go back to the origins, so whether you go back to Moses or Jesus or Muhammad, the understanding is that these people never meant their job purpose, their call it their prophetic visions, their writings, their teachings were never meant to create a rote following of rules, which is unfortunately for, for many people, or at least historically, what religion has been seen as, which is, this doesn't make sense, but God wants you to do it, and if you do it, God will be happy with you. And if you don't do it, God will be angry with you. That doesn't make any sense, but aside from that, it's also not the truth, as, as the way we see it. The, the only purpose of what became known as the world's religion was a deep spiritual wisdom for only one purpose, to help the individual transform, to be able to achieve the life that we're meant to have. And when that's the view, you can call it religion, you can call it technology, the, the words are less important than the understanding of, what, of what, is, what, what is meant, which is that, at least the way we understand it, the Kabbalists understand it, religion as many of us know it was not the original thought, was not the original idea. That the only whether and therefore whether again uh, this spiritual wisdom is whether whether you're Jewish Christian Muslim or 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 none of the above or something else because it's viewed as simply a a wisdom that to be learned as for the individual to become transformed and become a better person on a consistent basis. Religion, unfortunately, as we said throughout history, has not always been either viewed or used in that way, uh, and that. Not only, as we said, is not not only needs to be a shift. I think certainly uh, from that uh, thought of a road following of rules, which again, as I said, both doesn't make sense, but and neither was the original intention, but also sometimes completely distracts from the purpose. Which the simple, single, simple, single question is: Am I a better person today than I was yesterday? Have I changed tomorrow? Will I be a changed person tomorrow than today? And that constant change was the only purpose for. We'll call it Moses' teachings, Jesus' teachings, all that has become religion. And therefore, when we call it a technology or we call it a spiritual wisdom, the, the, the understanding has to both has to make sense. And most importantly, and I think maybe this is the key, you have to see it working. You know, my father, my teacher, the rabbi often used that phrase that, you know, they would say, you know, the Missouri is in the United States called the show me state, right? And they said true spiritual wisdom has to always answer that question. Show me. Is it working for me? Not, oh, I'm doing this so that when I leave this world, God will be happy with me and he'll put me in a good place. If it's true, if it's true and powerful and it works, I need to see the changes here and now. In some spiritual and religious traditions, there's a sense that making lots of money or having physical success in, in the world is somehow tawdry and shallow and distracts us from deeper spiritual pursuits. So you should if you want to be a, a holy person or, or a righteous person in some way, you should withdraw from the world and live a modest life like a monk or a holy man on a mountaintop. And in Kabbalah, there doesn't seem to be that sense of conflict between being successful in worldly terms and being spiritual. How come? 
So I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a few teachings that relate to this. So um, I was actually just studying this yesterday. There's a teaching that says that any great teacher, they were referring to Moses in this case, had to have both strength, wisdom, and wealth. That Moses could not have been Moses and could not have revealed what's called the Torah, the Bible, had he not had all three of those attributes, strength, wisdom, and wealth. Because we understand everything to be what we call, and this might have to go a little bit deeper into this, what we call the light of the creator. So what is our view of everything that exists, money included? Everything is only what we call the light of the creator. You know, we, and maybe we'll take a minute here, well, if it makes sense, I think, to talk about between the, the, the Kabbalistic view of what others would call God. So I always make the joke that, you know, some people have a vision of God as this old guy in the sky with a white beard, right? Which, of course, is silly, right? They, you'd have to be, you know, immature to in any way think of God in that way. Kabbalistically, the view of God, which I think gets closer, and this is where it's, I think, both important and beautiful to science, which is that God is an energy. It is an energy, the primordial energy that, that brought this world into being. And it is also that energy that sustains everything that exists. You and I are both an aspect of what we call that light or that energy of the, of the creator. And everything that, we, that exists in the world is an aspect of that light. And therefore, everything in this world has a very positive part to it. Of course, everything also has the, the converse, a, a potential negative to it. But when we understand that everything is energy, God is energy, what, what others would call God, we often refer to as the creator of the light, the creator is energy, then money is energy as well. And when the, the Kabbalists say that Moses could not have been Moses had he not been wealthy, it means because it is a connection to that energy as well that allowed him to gain greater wisdom. So that's where I would begin sort of the, 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 the Kabbalistic view of wealth, which is, it is often actually a necessary prerequisite to attaining wisdom, which, is, which I think is a, I, I like that it's a little bit, I would say a little bit controversial, but, but it's the teachings that have been around for thousands of years. Number one. Number two, the Kabbalistic view, and the word Kabbalah, as I said before, means to receive, is that the singular purpose we exist, the singular purpose for which we exist, is to receive. Now, how to receive, what is the right way to, there are right ways to receive, there are wrong ways to receive, of course. But if the foundational principle of life is that I came into this world to receive, and to receive goodness, abundance of goodness, that that both my view and what I would call the creator's view of the way my life and your life and every single person in this world's life is meant to be, is a life that is a constant growing abundance and goodness. That's life as it should be. That's life as what I would say the creator intends it to be. Well, then, of course, there should be no limit on any aspect of my life. My love should be limitless that I receive and give. My wealth should be limitless that I receive and give. My wisdom should be limitless that I receive and give. So not only is it not a negative, it is actually along the line of the singular purpose why, why I'm in this world. Now, of course, of course, money can't be used in negative ways. Uh, chasing after money can be done in negative ways. Of course, that's a whole other conversation. But foundationally, foundationally, it is the understanding that, that wealth, and goodness are the reasons why we're in this world. And which leads me to the third point. One of my favorite quotes from the Talmud says that when a person leaves this world, and I was actually talking about this to a student the other day, he was asking me, should I limit, sort of, he, he's somebody who has, you know, money to spend and to enjoy life. Should I limit, I sometimes feel, he says, I'm spending too much time on, uh, you know, my, spending money on things that I enjoy. I said, the opposite is true. It says in the Talmud that when a person leaves this world, one of the questions that he's asked in judgment is, is there anything that you could have enjoyed in this world that you did not enjoy? And the creator would then be upset because the only reason why I put all of this in front of you is for you to increase in, in pleasure, in joy, in abundance, in wealth all the time. Now, of course, of course, as we said before, there are many, the right way to attain wealth, the right way to use wealth and so on. But, but as, a, as a foundational understanding, the Kabbalistic view, is that not only is it not the, the you know against spirituality to attain the desire and the attainment of wealth, but as a matter of fact, often it's a prerequisite. It is certainly foundational to why we are in this world, 
And as a matter of fact, if you think about judgment, one of the things that one will be judged on when he or she leaves this world is whether he partook of all the pleasures, again, that he was supposed to partake of in this world. So we'll talk about this in in much more depth, I hope, how to build a kind of a balanced approach to money, wealth accumulation, giving, sharing, giving to our kids and the like, things like that, so that we can kind of tie together some of the spiritual rules from this ancient wisdom, but also some of the things that I've observed in lots of my interviews with famous investors. And I thought I'd kick off actually by reading you a paragraph about Sir John Templeton that I wrote in my book, which is very appropriate here because Templeton was probably the greatest global investor of the 20th century, but he was also a very spiritual guy. He was a devout Christian, but also passionate like you are about science. And he set up a charitable foundation that funded research into the power of prayer and virtues like forgiveness. And um, he was also famously frugal to, to an almost kind of crazy degree, um, you know, stapling together bits of paper to, to write his notes on the scrap paper and the like. And he always refused to fly first class despite being a billionaire because he said, you know, he would never squander his money on, on this stuff. And so here's what I, what I wrote just in a brief paragraph that I wanted to run by you and see if it, it stirred any thoughts for you. So I wrote, Templeton's watchfulness over money also stemmed from his belief that we are merely temporary stewards of God's wealth. He liked to begin meetings at his fund company with a prayer, and he saw a strong connection between spirituality and material success. If you focus on spiritual matters, you will very likely become wealthy, he told me. I never found a family that tithed 10% of their income to charity for 10 years that didn't become both prosperous and happy. So tithing is the single best investment in the world. He had even developed a new form of super tithing. For every dollar I spend on myself, he said, I carefully give away $10. So it's curious what you think about, you know, this, yes. this, I, there are so many ideas here, but for one, just this connection between how we live spiritually and our wealth and almost this sense that, you know, they're, well, this sense that they're tethered together very tightly. Absolutely. So there's a, a few thoughts, but I'll start with, with that one, which is that if we understand that naturally, the natural state of being should be an individual with abundance, then the question is, what stops that? And we, Kabbalistically, spiritually, we would say that when the pers- the individual is not growing in the way that he or she is meant to be growing, not changing in the positive ways that he or she is meant to be changing, when that creates what we call a blockage in that flow of energy to the individual. And therefore, the understanding is that the most important work, of course, we have to do the physical work to attain wealth and success. But the most important work is the spiritual work. Because if my connection to that energy of abundance, what we call the light of the creator, is not flowing, then it doesn't matter that much all the great input of work that I will do in the physical because the spiritual is blocked, which is the source of the blessings. What causes blockages? Well, again, to, to use general terms, of course, when we act selfishly, when we act with ego, when we when we act angry, when, when we speak negative words, there's a whole list of actions that I think many of us even intuitively know are not the right thing to do. But the understanding is, and this is why we're where the science, I would say, of Kabbalah becomes so important, is that it's not, you know, that God, again, gets angry at you, and therefore you're not going to have. No, it's that imagine if there are channels, you know, pipelines coming down into your life, and you literally, you know, put sandbags uh, below them. Of course, the flow is going to stop. God isn't angry with you, but you just did an, a- an action. Like if you if you went to the plumber and said, you know, I don't know why there's no water running in my house, and he comes to your house and says, did you close, shut off the, the great, the, the major valve, that brings the water to you. You have to say, yes, I still don't understand why there's no water. Well, look at you like you're an idiot. Of course, if you shut off the main valve that brings in water into your house, you're not going to have water in the rest of your house. So this is the spiritual view. Again, God is not a punishing God. God, what we call the light of the creator, is a flow of energy. And when we do things that put that put that open up those channels by being charitable, for example, by give by giving tithing, for example, by being kind, for example, then we open up those channels. When we behave in negative ways, we close those channels. So all that to say that, of course, if you had to understand, not of course you need both the physical and the spiritual, but that without the spiritual, the the efforts that we put into the physical work will be always be limited. If our spiritual connection to that flow of energy of abundance is limited, and all we have to do is look at our week, at our day, and our, our life, and 
and ask the question, how many actions do I do that are actually clogging that, that, that flow of energy, that flow of abundance? And then that, that'll answer the question, why am I putting all this effort in at work and still things aren't, don't seem to be flowing, success, it doesn't seem to be occurring. So we, it's, it's actually a, um, a section in the Talmud that um, my father's teacher would often uh, share with him. And they asked the question, they literally asked the question, what should a person do to become wealthy? So first they answer, he should invest all of his time and effort at work in the physical world. And then they ask the question, is the Talmud, this is the way the Talmud works, question and answer. Um, but many people have done that and they did not become wealthy. So then they answer, well, then he should spend time and effort on his spiritual work and then he will become wealthy. But then they ask the question, but a lot of people did that and that didn't work. So they come to the conclusion, one without the other will not work. You need both. You need the spiritual work that opens up the channels, and you need the intense physical work that allows that flow to, to manifest in our world. So, to, so I, 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 by the way, I, I, that is a beautiful quote that I, from John Templeton that I actually want to start using, if you don't mind, uh, in, my, in my sharings with people. But I think that is both fundamentally true, but also I think for all people who are struggling in one way or the other, I think it's also a beginning of an answer of what, what we can do to, to start opening up those channels of light. There's also something related that I think you'll enjoy, which is from Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, who's this 99-year-old polymathic genius. And when I first spoke with Munger back in, I think it was 2017, I went to this meeting of a company called The Daily Journal, where he was the chairman. He's also more famously the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, which is you know this $700 billion behemoth. And, um, and at this meeting, Charlie said, um, he basically starts talking about why his hero is Maimonides, this this famous 12th century rabbi that you often quote, who who was also obviously a, a pioneering doctor, who uh, I guess was the doctor to Saladin, the, the ruler yes. of Egypt. And so I'll, I'll read you what Munger said. He said, uh, he, he was talking about the dangers of being disengaged from reality and just being sort of sitting off in the, you know, in your ivory tower, think, you know, thinking about ideologies or going to sort of super political universities where you're just sort of, you know, thinking about ideas without actually doing anything. And he said, you can't just be dreaming how you think the world should be run and that it's too dirty for you to get near it. My hero is Maimonides. All that philosophy and all that writing he did after working 10 or 12 hours a day as a practicing physician all his life, he believed in the engaged life. And so I recommend the engaged life. You want to do something every day where you're coping with the reality, you want to be more like Maimonides. Absolutely. So that's really interesting. That again, it's like being being in the mud of day to day life. Absolutely. I know if I can share with you two teachings that that it brings to mind, one is there's a verse in the in the Bible in the Torah. It says, "You should be holy." Kedoshim to you, which literally means you should be holy. Ki uh, kadoshani Hashem, because I. God, the Creator, is holy. And the Kabbalists explain that that means the Creator is telling us, I am holier than you. What does that mean? So my father's teacher said, there are those who have a view of spirituality, which is, again, go to a, run away from, 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 from where everybody else is, to a mountaintop or to the forest, and meditate and study, and that's the ultimate spiritual journey. But the Creator is saying, no, that, that, that's, is, that is above you. That is not why I put you in this world. I put you in this world so that you partake, you become, as you said, engaged in the dirt of this world, in the filth of this world, and from that be able to extract some some light or some 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 worth. Uh, so certainly, the Kabbalistic view is that is, and without going to details, my father's teacher, who uh, who uh, Rob Brandwein was the spiritual leader of the workers' union in in, in Israel. And the reason he took that job is because it was one it was one of his, you know, as you probably know, historically, there has been this view amongst religious groups that the greatest sages are the ones, again, who spend all their time all just in study uh, and pursuit of wisdom. He believed, and it says, that wisdom without work is not wisdom. That the, the quote is, again, that if you're not living in this world, your wisdom is, is all for naught, for naught. And so it's a very strong line in the Kabbalistic wisdom that the own that again wisdom is not even really wisdom cannot be considered wisdom if it's not borne out in in engagement in this world. And I'll add one more story. One of my many you I'm really you might know you know but maybe your listeners don't that um, the Kabbalists, especially those who are students of the great Kabbalists from Ukraine, 
the Baal Shem Tov would often give their teachings and stories. And this is one of the stories that is, that is, that is given. The story is about a, um, a we know, some of you might know that on the, this, what we call the High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, is a time that we sort of spiritually set up our year. Everything that's going to, it's said that everything that's going to happen in that year, well, health, everything that's going to occur is, is prepared based on our connections that occur on the High Holidays or Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And one of those, on one of those days, the, the Kabbalist sat down to students afterwards and said, I want to tell you, because he was able to see, what you asked for in your prayers for the next year, and also what the heavens responded, what the Creator responded. He says to one student, he says, you know, you run an inn. In those days, it was very common for people to run this inn, pub, where they had a few rooms, a small, a small inn, and you run an inn, and, uh, but you realize that in all the hours that you have to spend running the pub around, around drunk people, around sort of lower people, you don't have any time to really study. You don't have any time to really pray. You don't have time for your spiritual work. So you prayed to the Creator, and you said, you know what? In the beginning of this year, give me all the money that I need. I don't want to be wealthy, but I just want to have all my expenses taken care of. And then I can dedicate the entire year just to study, to prayer, and to spiritual work. And then the next day, in the prayers, you, you rethought your request. And you said, you know what? If I get all my money in the beginning of the year, I might just spend too much time worrying about it. And, and I won't really dedicate all of my time to, to, to the spiritual work. So give me half in the beginning of the year, half in the second half of the year, and then I'll be able to dedicate the whole year. And then the afternoon came. And in the prayer, you reconsidered your request again. And you said, you know what? I'm still afraid. That amount of money in the beginning will be too much. I'll spend too much time worrying about it. So give me it in quarters. Every quarter, give me all the money that I need for that quarter. So then I can, don't have to worry about money. I don't have to run this pub with all the drunkards around me. And I could dedicate my life to the spiritual work and to study and to prayer. And do you want to know what he said to a student with the heavens answer to your prayer? He said, of course, of course. He says, you think that you came into this world to be this pure spiritual being. That's not why you're here. Angels exist, and the Creator has enough angels in the heavens. You're in this world to be engaged in this world, to be in the filth of this world, to be around the drunkards in the pub, and still find three minutes for some spiritual action. That's why you're in this world. And that, of course, is, is, to, is to your point, and to Charlie Munger's point, that, that the reason we're in this world is not co a coincidence. We're not here to run away from it. We're here to be engaged in it, yet to be able to extract from it the the, the few minutes and moments of of spiritual connection and elevation. Yeah, it's funny. I, I I was writing to someone yesterday. I always have this fantasy of a calm, peaceful life, and it never seems to happen. I'm always somewhat overwhelmed, juggling too many things, feeling stressed and the like. You're in the club. It's funny. You know, when I was growing up, if you asked me what my dream life would be, it was always the same dream to go to the north of Israel, Sfat, the sort of the city of Kabbalists, and have, you know, be married with my kids, and but just study all day and all night, not engage with any person ever, which is the exact opposite of what my life is today. But because that is the truth, the truth is that we are not in this world to run away from it. We're in this world to be engaged in the mud of it, and to yet extract great light and and, and enjoyment for someone from it. I wanted to talk in more detail about how to increase our enjoyment of the money we have, because you did a very interesting podcast a couple of years ago with your wife, Monica, the Spiritually Hungry podcast, where you talked about how to enjoy our money in a more balanced way. And you talked about growing up without money yourself and having to buy clothes in thrift shops and the like, but never having any sense of, of lack. And so you were saying that the most important thing is not how much money we have, but being able to enjoy what money we do have and get pleasure and fulfillment from it. So I wanted to talk in a bit more depth about how actually to do this. And the first thing you said, if I remember rightly, there are a whole slew of points that are worth discussing here. But one of the things you talked about that's kind of a provocative idea is the importance of recognizing that the money is not yours in the first place, which is something that Templeton talked about there, right, where he talked about being a, a steward of, of God's wealth. Can you talk about that idea and why it's why it's helpful to think this way. Yes, it's very important. And there's actually a few points open that you mentioned that are, but I'll, I'll talk about this one first. So first of all, you say it's a little controversial, but the reality, of course, is that if you think about it for more than five seconds, you realize that it's true, right? No wealthy man ever takes his money into the grave. I mean, he might be able to physically take it. It does, does him or her no good. 
So objectively, philosophically, the money is not ours, right? That's that's just a a a, a, a factual uh, reality. But more importantly, if we understand that everything is energy, and and more importantly, that none of what we have is actually ours, and this is true again, not just of money, it's true of wisdom. How many wise people have a stroke and in a second all that wisdom it seems to no longer exist? This thought that we have, right? How many times people have a car that they love and something happens, right? So the, the, the times that people think that they own something and then it goes away is, is you know, 99% of the time. It might take a year, five years, 50 years. This body within which we live, to think that it is mine is ridiculous because we all know that unfortunately at a certain point, it no longer uh, continues to serve us. That is all to say that the false view of that which we have acquired, which the ego wants us to take ownership of, which this is my wisdom, this is my money, this is my car, this is my child. That thought, which comes from the ego and is false, it is not is a, it is objectively not physically true, but more importantly, certainly not spiritually true. All we are given are gifts for purpose, either to enjoy, to partake, to share them. When we really and truly view everything that we have as not ours, but as given to us, again, for to take care of, if it's a tremendous amount of wealth, a big part of that, of course, will have to be its purpose is to share. But but it's true about wealth. And even our children, some of the, mo- the greatest pain that we ever feel stems from the ego convincing us that this thing is mine. And then when anybody tries to either take take it away from me, or succeeds in taking it away from me, that causes great pain because this thing that was mine has now been taken away from me. If you view it as, no, this is not, this was never mine. This was never mine. It was given to me. Maybe it was given to me for a day. Maybe it was given to me for a week. First, you have greater enjoyment of it because your appreciation for it never wanes. I just wanted to jump in here and tell you about this new valuable resource that we created for you. The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. If you're not satisfied with where you're at financially, whether that be not having enough savings at the end of each month, watching your cash being eroded away by inflation, or maybe you're not sure where to get started with investing, Down in the description below, we put together a free guide for you called the four simple steps to take control of your personal finances and life. You can get this free guide by clicking the link in the description below. And again, I, there's a lot, I want to go to this point of appreciation, which I think is foundational to, to, to this idea. There's a teaching that says that when we take anything, money, gifts, wisdom as our own, what we're actually doing, and this might be a deep spiritual concept, we're separating it from its source. What we call the light of the creator, that energy that is that is sustaining, that is flowing all the time. If we, our ego convinces us, no, this is my money, this is my wisdom, that thought separates it from its source. And what happens, what happens to a flower when you cut it off from the ground? It begins to die. Now, it might take a day or a week or a month, but it begins to die. So if we understand that the thought of ownership, the thought of ownership actually cuts the way away our blessing, be it our money, be it anything that we have away from its source, it will of course lose its life force and therefore the pleasure that we're able to extract from it. So the reason, many reasons, but one of the reasons it's so important to live with a thought, with a consciousness of not ownership, but again, having it for a certain amount of time, an undetermined amount of time, it first of all spiritually allows our blessings to be connected to their source, which allows them to be able to be to be receiving life force, and therefore we can continue to receive pleasure from them. Because again, why we know this again, relationships is probably the most obvious case. And I always use this example because it's sadly true. Almost everybody on the first date is very excited. Almost everybody on their wedding day is very excited. The majority of the world by year five is not as excited, certainly. And by year seven, most people are divorced. And by year 10, most people are unhappy. So 
let's look at that continuum, right? And um, I'm sure you know Daniel Kahneman, yeah. um, and so he writes the fact that that marriage is the most is the is is the silliest thing that people do because the 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 facts and the figures tell us it's a terrible choice, right? People still continue to make it, but but I think more importantly, let's go to the to the root of that. Why is that the reality where people have this hope for love for relationships that almost always dies? It almost always dies, and one of the reasons is. Because when you marry somebody, you believe that they are yours. Not remembering nobody, certainly, but nothing really is ever mine. And I, therefore, I have to be earning it every single day. That appreciation can only truly stem if if you truly believe that you do not own it. And if you understand that you do not own this great marriage, not, not on day one and not on year 10 and not on year 25, then you have the possibility, or I would say the ability, to have the love in your relationship grow, taking that back to what we were talking about before as it pertains to wealth. The second, and unfortunately, I would say most people, and it's an important question for people to ask themselves, how do I view my relationship with that which I acquire? Be it money, be it a car, be it a house. Has my ego convinced me that it is mine? Well, that is the first step to its dying. Now, death can come in many ways. It could be that you hold on to that money, but it doesn't give you pleasure. It can mean, uh, mean, of course, you don't hold on to that money. But the only way to truly maintain and to continuously be able to receive great pleasure from the money and acquisitions that we that we that we take in in this life is by remembering it is not mine. That, as we said, keeps it connected to its source, which allows the life force, that energy, to continue to flow through it. Because money is energy, which is an important topic. Maybe we'll talk about a little bit later. But it allows it to continue to, to, to be in that flow of energy. And therefore, I'm able to extract from it more pleasure. And secondly, which is very important, it allows me to maintain appreciation. And the, the understanding that, that this thing that I have, because it's not mine, I have, wow, I woke up this morning and this million dollars is still in my bank account. Or this beautiful car that I enjoy is still in my driveway. You know, I'm sure most of us remember, and I have many clear memories of this as a child, when you get a new toy, right? And usually you play with it all day and you get sort of sort of bored with it. But as a child, often you wake up the next day, it's almost like it's brand new to you and you enjoy it. That's the way our life is meant to be, whether it's our relationship to money, whether it's relationship to, to the physical things that we enjoy, never ownership, only use for an undetermined amount of time, and therefore great appreciation. And if you're able to maintain those two things, which is the thought that this blessing, is, this gift, this money is not mine, but it's connected to a higher source. And second, therefore, I have great appreciation and a growing appreciation for it every day that I wake up. Then that is able to maintain the energy within the money and therefore the pleasure that, that we receive. And one more point to this. There's a verse from King Solomon. He says that you will find often wealth kept with the individual for their detriment. Osher shamur lebalav lerato. That people, there are a lot of people, and unfortunately, I've met people like this, and I'm sure you have, who have a lot of money, but are not able to extract great pleasure from it, or at least not the pleasure you would expect them to be able to extract from it. And that that is because of these two things. They have taken ownership on it and therefore necessarily will lose appreciation for it. This question of appreciation is so practical and profound. And I, I remember several years ago you gave a talk one Saturday where you, you use this wonderful phrase from the Old Testament that I think was katonti mikol hachasadim, which, as I remember you translating it, was something along the lines of, I'm, I'm humbled or made small by, overwhelmed by all of my blessings, all of my gifts. And I wrote it down both in Hebrew and in English to look at it every day, to kind of hammer into my brain in the sort of way that Munger talks about, pounding good ideas, simple but good ideas into our brain through repetition. Because it, it felt to me so important as a way, a sort of practical means, instead of constantly reminding myself that there are other people who are so much richer and smarter and better looking, and uh, you know that I, I I would just keep coming back and being like, no, 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 I'm overwhelmed by all of the gifts I've been given. Can you talk about that idea just as a sort of a, a very practical way to keep pounding into our head this this sense that we're not coming from a place of of lack but abundance? Absolutely. And it relates to something you, you mentioned before, and it's a, it's a, it's a quote, for, again, from the Talmud that says, who is a wealthy man? The, the one who is appreciative of what he or she has, right? That is happy with what they have. 
the reality is that it is, you know, again, this, I, I often like to talk, you know, sort of the line between fact or, or reality and spirituality. We know that, and, this, and there's studies on this, that the, the dollar amount that a person has in their bank account does not correlate with, with, with happiness. That is just a fact, right? It's a, studied, a studied fact. So if you understand that each one of us can be wealthy, regardless of the amount of money that we have or the amount of acquisitions that we have, the only differentiator, the only differentiator is this, is appreciation. You know, I often use, it's, you know, sort of the, the, the story of the guy who gets the call from the doctor, right? He had the tests and, and, he, and, and the test didn't look so good. So the doctor said, we have to do this further testing. And he gets that call. And the call the doctor says, everything is okay. You don't have this disease. In that second, and we, we can all imagine that second, certainly those of us who are a little bit older, you know, we, in that second, there's nothing that can bother you, right? You just got your, but what changed? Literally, absolutely nothing. You were healthy before the phone call. You are healthy after the phone call. The joy that you're experiencing now, and su such great joy that literally, if your worst enemy came and slapped you in the face, it wouldn't bother you because you're so happy right now, is you gained appreciation for the life that you had as it was a second ago. And appreciation, therefore, is probably the most important trait that we need to develop, both for happiness, but then also for wealth. But happiness, of course, is the most important thing, because if you had more wealth and you'd be sadder, you wouldn't want that wealth. The only reason we want to achieve greater wealth is because we hope and believe that greater wealth would bring us greater happiness. But I'm telling you that the most important thing that you can do to, to attain real happiness in life is to grow your 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 ability to appreciate. And like you said, be, with, with that verse, so it's a verse that was said by Jacob, and literally, as you said, taking that time, and by the way, the science around this as well, which uh, you probably know that it's a site, they've done studies on this, that people who spend their Sundays creating a list of gratitude or what they're appreciative of live a more successful and happier life. That is a fact, because it's based on a spiritual rule that the indicator or the 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 what causes our pleasure is our appreciation for it. So, what in fact, if I I know for myself, the most I, I work on many aspects, hopefully of myself and things that I want to change. But the one thing that is always constant that I try to wake up with every single morning, and therefore there's a Kabbalistic meditation that we do every single morning, right? That that we awaken appreciation for being alive, and. If any one of us truly appreciated life, the second of life that we have now, the second of life that we have next, we'd be the happiest person in the world. Unfortunately, the, 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 the flow of life causes us to lose appreciation for all things, for all things. And we spoke about that a little bit before. If I could maybe, you know, I often in our podcast, I try to leave the, I know we're not, we still have a, a ways to go, but if I can really, really underscore this for the listeners that one of the most important things that you can do is find a way to awaken greater appreciation every single day. Um, in my, I, I'll use this example in my, and you have to meditate on it, by the way. You know, and often it's, a, you know, you meditate on, you know, well, how would I feel that this didn't exist? You know, I don't appreciate, a person doesn't appreciate their health. Think for a minute, for five minutes, how would you feel if you had to be in the hospital right now? A person doesn't appreciate their wife or their spouse. How would you feel right now if you were by yourself? A person doesn't, and, and you'll see that you, meditate on these areas of life with which you have abundance already, but have lost appreciation over time, you will see how much happier you are. And I one test that I test myself is how often in a week do I feel overwhelmed with appreciation? Not for something new. We all can, can awaken appreciation for the new money that comes in, the new gift that comes in, the new relationship that comes in, of course. I'm talking about how often in a week do I sense an overwhelming appreciation for what I have, Cut, like, like that verse that you said, that, that I could never have done the work, whatever that is, to, to, to deserve all this abundance of gifts that I have. And it's kind of a crazy thing that, that every single one of us is, 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 is wealthy. Every single one of us has abundance. But we've lost appreciation for that which we have abundance for. And I'd like to tie that into one other important teaching which maybe gives the greater impetus. Although I think being ha the happiest person in the world is probably the most important impetus. But Ravashlag says, the great Kabbalist and founder of the center says, 
that the vessel, we know that in order to have more, more money, more wisdom, more joy, you have to have what we call a vessel, desire. But he says, the vessel for my next success, the vessel for my next money, the vessel for my next blessing is my appreciation for the blessings that I have. So much so that if I, to the degree that I lack in appreciation, an overwhelming appreciation for the blessings that I currently have, the abundance that I currently have, it becomes almost impossible for me to receive the next gift, the next wealth that I meant to achieve and that I meant to have. It's it's funny. I had a, a conversation about these sort of topics with a famous investor named Howard Marks a few years back. And Howard, last time I looked, oversees something like $170 billion, and he's a multi-billionaire. And he he he's Jewish, but grew up actually as a Christian scientist. But he's sort of on the fence about his spirituality. You know, he's a, he's a great rationalist and also kind of um, very thoughtful about, uh, about you know, the, the larger questions of life. And he often talks about the importance of humility for him, both as an investor, but in, in every area of life. And so he was saying, look, everything that's happened to me that's been good that allowed me to become a multi-billionaire was all based on luck. And it, it started even with the fact that he got his first job, I think, at a bank that became Citigroup later. But he desperately had wanted to go to Lehman Brothers, which subsequently went bankrupt. But he didn't get that job because the guy who was supposed to call him and tell him that he'd been hired got drunk and had a hangover and failed ever to call him. And he only found out about it many years later. And, and so he was listing all of the ways in which he'd got lucky that really had nothing to do with his own efforts or brilliance or intelligence or anything. And I once gave an interview where I mentioned how he had this incredibly high IQ and it, you know, it had clearly contributed to his success. And he emailed me afterwards and he said, look, people who don't fully acknowledge their luck miss the fact that being intelligent is nothing but luck. No one does anything to deserve a high IQ. And I thought that was really interesting that even you know, for someone like Howard Marks, it actually it it helped him to keep focusing on his on his good fortune because it made him, for one thing, more humble, and so it protected him from what I call master of the universe syndrome, where you start to believe, "Wow, I'm so talented and so smart that you end up overreaching and and taking too much risk and blowing yourself up." Absolutely, and it relate everything that we said even before, right? The ego that comes from lack of humility, the ego that comes from the thought that I've done it. I, I, I mentioned this in one of my lectures. I think it was uh, Bill Gates who said, you know, to be who, who Bill Gates became, he needed millions and millions of people. There's no, there's not, there's no one person in the world who will ever be successful on their own. You know, whether it's the university, the, all the teachers in the university that he went to, all the, you know, we, you know, that, that statement takes a village. It takes the world to make any one person successful. And which should help us both you gain humility, but also realize how silly it would be to take ownership, again, whether it's on our intelligence or whether it's on our wealth. Yes, of course, you know, it, it takes certain attributes to be able to 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 grow, but you will have, I'm sure we know this, right? Two people with, with the same level of intelligence, one will be successful, one will not be. Two people with the same level of desire, one will be, one won't be successful. So if it's clearly, right, objectively not the, the physical attributes or even, even work of one person that makes them more successful than the other, then the question becomes, then what is it? But at the most basic level, it would be, it's not me. It's not my ego. And maintaining that humility gains, hopefully gives us the ability to maintain appreciation. And spiritually, I believe that when we are able to maintain that humility and appreciation, we're able to grow with our wealth. And I've met, I, I've met many, many people who are very, We'll call them successful in the in the physical sense, but are very unsuccessful in the in the happiness sense. And and I don't know if you would say there's often a, a, um, a negative correlation, but there certainly is not a positive correlation. And I think it, it boils down to the what we, we I would call the ego, what we would refer to as the ability to maintain humility and the ability to maintain a lack of ownership on that which we have achieved and that which we have acquired. Yeah, I I remember this. Um multi-billionaire, a famous art collector as well, David Khalili, who, who I once introduced you to, saying to me once that he had all of these um, multi-billionaire friends who he described as poor rich people. Interesting. I thought Interesting. it was a wonderful phrase. And then he said he, he also knew plenty of rich, poor people. But I love that phrase, poor rich people. Right. Because as, as we said before, the, 
being happy is a cor correlated to how much pleasure we are able to extract from that which we have. And if I can, if I go a little bit deeper, there's a spiritual concept here, and it's one of my favorite ones. But it might be too deep, and really, you let me know if it's too deep or it needs to be. I, I won't be able to understand it to point no, out. That no, you deep. definitely you go ahead, Michael. No. So the understanding is that the energy that we speak of, which we, we call the light of the creator, that energy that created this world, the 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 phrase that the Kabbalists refer to that energy is the endless, the endless, meaning it has no end. So what that means is that. If everything that exists, the shirt that I'm wearing, the microphone to which you're speaking, to which we're speaking, is a part of that energy. It means that everything has the potential to be endless. Everything is part of the endless. Everything came from the endless. And therefore, everything has limitless energy within it. I, I'll use a, even a practical example. We know that the splitting of an atom, which exists in abundance all around us, within us all the time, creates so much energy. Right? It must mean that internally there is much more energy in everything than we are currently extracting. So when I look at my wife, when I look at my uh, wisdom, when I look at anything that I have and I understand that it is not finite, that it actually has the ability to, to supply me with an, with an endless abundance. So my relationship can give me an endless amount of pleasure. My money, no matter how much it is, can, and in its current state, can, can supply me with an endless amount of pleasure. When you really, and again, this is not a, a simple concept, nor one that, that, they, that is easy to actually live with, but it gives you a completely different view on all things. And it gives you certainly a different view on life and on wealth. That everything, that every single one of us has right now in our life anything and everything that we need in abundance to be able to live a life of great happiness. The, pro the only problem is that we're not able, we're not currently able to extract the endless energy from our money, the endless energy from our relationship, the endless energy from anything that we have. Um, I, I remember there was a, a book that I read many, many years ago that spoke about the fact that the, the, the truly spiritual person could spend hours meditating and gaining pleasure from the rose. Because, and that's true, right? That, that, that if everything is connected to the endless energy and an endless light, that means that everything has the potential, at least the potential, to give me endlessly, endless pleasure. And, and appreciation, the humility, all of that are, are stepping stones toward being able to extract the, the endless energy from all of the things that are ours. Another thing that's obviously really an important aspect of enjoying one's wealth and not feeling controlled by it, uh, not becoming a slave to it, is being able to give money away, to share it. And I, I remember Templeton all those years ago when I met him. He was, he was probably 83 when I went to visit him in the Bahamas for a day. And he said, look, I'm the happiest and the busiest I've ever been because now all I'm doing is spiritual. I'm giving my money away. Um, he had this, this very idiosyncratic mission to increase what he called the spiritual wealth of mankind a thousandfold, I think. And, and likewise, when I think of a lot of the interviews that I've done with famous investors, People like Joe Greenblatt, one of the most legendary hedge fund managers, he's, he set up a network of something like 45 charter schools in New York City, where my son Henry works as a teacher. A lot of these guys are very, very focused on giving and sharing. The first person in my book, Monish Pabrai, uses the fact that he can make these, these kind of rational, dispassionate bets on stocks to lift tens of thousands of kids out of poverty across India, these very highly intelligent kids who come from very poor families. And I wonder if you could talk about this whole concept of injecting this this flow of giving and sharing, whether it's through charity or tithing or whatever, and why what I've observed in these people's lives would have a spiritual base on it. Why why do these people seem happier than the investors I've seen who are just, you know, building massive collections of Ferraris and bigger private planes and bigger yachts and and th those guys those guys um, don't seem quite as happy and fulfilled to me, but maybe maybe I'm deluding myself. Well, let's say, let's just say that it, they, it's possible to have all that pleasure and also be giving back, hopefully. Uh, but but let's talk to the spiritual concept of tithing, and this is of course a biblical concept. This is historically o always been around, and it relates back to what we were saying before that what keeps our gifts be it money, be it 
our relationships alive, right? Because unfortunately, we know people can have money. It could be dead money. It could be being a relationship. It could be a dead relationship, even if they're still maintaining the, the facade of it. What keeps anything alive is that flow of energy, what we call the light of the creator. And we need to be actively, and that's what we said before, humility, appreciation, connects, keeps connecting our blessings, our wealth to its source. When a person takes $10 that he or she made, and consciously, and this is what needs to be the consciousness of tithing, he or she says the following, I know all these $10 are not mine. None of it's mine. Yes, I worked for it. Yes, I, I, you know, I put in the hours. But I know that this is not mine. This is coming to me from what I would call the lights of the creator, from that energy. And therefore, to, to indicate, to clarify, to make very clear that this is not my money. I'm taking a part of it. I would take all of it, but I'll just take a one-tenth of it and give it towards sharing. So again, charity, in whatever way a person chooses to use that money. What the person does then is he actually connects the remaining $9 to their source. And therefore that money is alive. That money money is flowing with energy. That $9 left will give him more pleasure than somebody who has $100,000 that is not connected to its source, that is dead money. So the purpose of tithing or the per, the importance of giving money away isn't so much because I'm doing a favor to the poor man to whom I'm sharing. More importantly, more importantly, and therefore, for instance, the Zohar, the, Zohar, the Kabbalistic, basic Kabbalistic text refers to a poor man as a gift given to us by the Creator. Because when I give, when I have the ability to take one tenth of my money and give it to a poor man, it gives life to the nine dollars remaining. And when nine dollars are alive, they can grow and they they can give pleasure and they can give they can give me more abundance. When they, when those ten dollars, if I did not give it, are cut off from their source, they, then they begin to die. So tithing, and therefore the the Kabbalists use the phrase um, get tithe because in Hebrew it's a wor- word play, but the word tithe. Is the same comes from the same root as the word wealth. So the words that they say is aser bishvil shetit asher, which means tithe so that you become wealthy. Again, that tithing, what it does is it actively connects the money remaining in, with you to its source, and then that money can continue to grow and to flourish. So imagine what a person is doing by uh, tithing. Is he, you know, if you if you have a branch on a tree that you wanted to grow fruit by keeping it attached to the tree, it'll continue to give you fruits in abundance. When you don't give tithing, or when you keep the money only to yourself, you cut it off from from the source. You cut down the the branch from the tree. Of course, it will not continue to bear fruit for you. So the whole purpose, the capitalistic view, and often, you know, my father would often use the phrase. The reason I give all the time is because I'm the most selfish person in the world, and I know that the only way that I can continue receiving endlessly is if I give endlessly. And that's the idea of tithing, that by by tithing, and more importantly, the thought behind it, which is not my money, I may need to make sure that whatever money stays with me remains connected to its source, and therefore I take this as a token, as an action that says, I know that all of this is in mine, I'm going to take one-tenth of it, give it away, and that keeps my money attached, the, the, the branch to the tree, enabling it to bear more and more fruit, enabling it to bring more and more wealth, and therefore... There's actually a um, a verse in the Bible that says the only the Creator says test me on this test me, I promise you that if you tithe you will find abundance without without end without limit. It's a difficult thing because I I often find with charity and tithing and the like personally there's a there's a fear of being without. There's a part of me that's like, I buy into the idea that, yeah, I should give money away. I should be charitable. I should be a better person and it will benefit me. And then there's this deep seated kind of underlying simmering fear of, yeah, but what if it's not enough? What if I can't take care of my family, God forbid, or what if, uh, and I wonder how, how you deal with that, that lingering sense of fear and lack that you may not be okay. And what if I'm buying into this system? That isn't really true. It's well, its idea. So I, I would so I would put those in two different categories. I would definitely say if a person is concerned about literally paying their bills, I would not be rushing to tithe, although there are those who do that and they do find success with that. But I think the second group is a much bigger group, right? When we're not really concerned about paying right the the mortgage or 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 the, the electricity bills, but we still think you know that by giving, I I I, I lose some of it. 
in, in the first group, meaning people, if somebody's truly, truly concerned that they're not able to pay, you know, their their monthly bills, I, I wouldn't be pushing too much towards siding. But it's the rest of the group, which is a most most of the time, most of the people where there is that extra. But the fear is if they, if I give this, maybe next month, right? There's there's a, a quote in the Zohar that says a person who has enough money for 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 now and worries about tomorrow has no connection to the light of the Creator, right? But but most people are, are are in the category of yes, I have I have now, but what about tomorrow, the next day, next year, um, and therefore I have to you know hoard it only only for myself. To that group, I would say again, as the I would say the the verse says, try it, try it, give you know once ten percent, see what happens. It you know as we said it in the beginning, it, it has to be um, tried and true. Now in your book, and I'm sure we've all heard stories of people who have been very successful using this method. So I would always say, well, if so many successful people have used it and it's brought them success, it's so, that's some indication, aside from the fact that there's also so much ancient wisdom uh, written uh, around this, I would say try, as the creator says, try me and see if you do not experience greater abundance by by sharing. And maybe you don't start with one-tenth, maybe you start with one-fifth or, or something. Because, and, and to your point, which you said again before, and this is both anecdotally and, and also as, as proven by studies, that there's a reason why, for the most part, we enjoy sharing more than receiving. That 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 relates to the fact that the energy from which we come, what we call the light of the creator, is an energy that is always giving, never, never receiving for itself. And if I want more abundance, if I want more blessings, then I have to be more in line with that energy. So when my actions of sharing, what it what it does, aside from any benefit it has, to the person from, with which I am sharing, it puts me in contact closer to the flow of energy of the universe. We call the light of the creator, and therefore more abundance can come. And by the way, what I would say to those who are concerned about giving, let's say, one-tenth of their money, why don't you give one-tenth of your time? We all have something that we have a little bit more of that, that we can give. So I would maybe a person starts with one-tenth of their time that they, that they dedicate towards sharing. Because tithing, again, should be of everything, should be of our wisdom, should be of our money, should be of our time, should be of our love, should be of every aspect that, that we have. And again, I strongly believe that we will find that those actions, those small steps, for those of us who need small steps uh, of, of tithing, either of our time or any actions of sharing that we will do, we will see the benefits of them. I, I wanted to talk a bit about how not to give and share. And I, I've been looking through a lot of your old lectures and writings and the like. And and there are a couple of things that came up that I, I hope you can discuss. So one of them obviously is, is, is not to give and share in ways that are just designed to prop up our own ego. And there's a, there's a book of yours called Becoming Like God, where you wrote um, a dollar given with the conscious desire to grow, to become like God is an act of transformative sharing. A bequest of $10 million given for self-glorification, fame, and additional power is not. Can you talk about that sense of when giving kind of is nice, but maybe it comes with not the best consciousness and where we should sort of work on our consciousness so that it's not just about, you know, making ourselves look richer, more powerful, more influential and smarter. Yes. So to be clear, I think, and this happens all the time, a person who's a significant amount of money to where this through a hospital to a museum, always do that regardless I mean, it obviously brings benefit both to the individual to some degree and to the institution, of course. So I would always, I would never recommend against that. But as we look internally, each one of us, I would ask the question, if the reason why I want to share is because it what connects me to what I call that flow of the universe or, or the energy of the light of the creator, then it has to be true. Meaning when I give and whether it's a big check to a hospital or whether it's a you know a loan to my cousin, what feelings does that awaken within me? Any feelings that become attached to the ego, oh, I'm the big man, I'm the person who can do it, it diminishes the energy of that giving and therefore diminishes the benefit that I will receive from that giving. Of course, it's always good to lend people who need money. Of course, it's always good to give charity to those in, in institutions that are in need. But... I always bring it back to me. What will bring me the greatest benefit from this action? And the, 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 the reality is that the more selfless, the more true, 
the more it is coming from that part of me that I call my soul, that is connected to that force of sharing, the more powerful it will be for me, the more benefit that I will receive in return from that action. So any action of sharing is, 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 is worthwhile. But if we talk about the ultimate, the ultimate way that we can benefit, and that's the reason we give. We do not give because simply we want to be a good person, which is nice. I give and I share because I know that I need for my growth those actions of sharing, that that gives me abundance, that that gives me blessings. The pure that action can be, the more powerful it will be for me. The receiver might be just as happy with the ten dollars that I, the thousand dollars that I give them that I that is all for my ego, and the thousand dollars that I give them that is truly from the place of my soul that is simply an action of sharing. But I will not receive the same benefit, and therefore I think it's very important for those of us who are, and I hope all of us to some degree are involved in actions of sharing, um, that we make sure to the degree that we can that we're, we can receive the greatest benefit from them. And the way to receive the greatest benefit from actions of sharing is to make sure that I am coming from the purest place, not of ego, but of a desire to share more importantly, because it connects me to the source of where all of my blessings come from. There's another big issue that a lot of us wrestle with of how to give money and share with our kids without spoiling them, wrecking their desire to achieve stuff for themselves. And Warren Buffett famously said, you should give your kids enough money so they can do anything, but not enough so that they'll do nothing. And that's guided a lot of people in the investment business. So that you know, it gives it, it it gives them the justification to give away a lot of money, but they they still give something to their kids so that you know they'll have a decent head start in life. Um, there's a concept in Kabbalah that I've found incredibly profound of bread of shame, and I wondered if you could talk about that and uh, how what it what it means and how basically we can give money away or help our kids or family members in ways that will actually help them rather than disempower them. Absolutely. So like you said, it's a foundational uh, teaching of Kabbalah that the question, the philosophical, theological question is asked, why are we in this world? Why, why isn't the world perfect? Why is there pain, suffering, and death? Why do we all come to struggles in our life? If God is good, if that call it the endless light, call it the creator is good, why isn't everything good in this world? And the answer is, because if everything was created in its perfected state, we would never have earned it. And we would be experiencing what is called bread of shame, being bread or what is given to us without having earned it causes us to feel unhappy with it. Because our root, where we come from, is that light of the creator. We are all made of that light, of that energy, that energy that is of sharing, that is of creating. If we came into a world created in its perfection, we would, we would enjoy it for a while, maybe a long while, but eventually we would come to the point where we would understand, I didn't create this, I didn't earn this. My energy, my where we come from is the, is the force that creates things, that, that makes things better, and therefore eventually we would be unhappy with it. And therefore, the answer to the question, why is this world as it is? Why do we have to work so hard to make it better? Is because we need to earn it. Because ultimately, our soul would never be satisfied with anything that was created for us that we did not create. So it's a very important foundational, theological, philosophical uh, reason for, for, for the creation of our world, for of our being in it. But it's a truth that continues to flow through life. And I'm, I'm sure most of us have, real, have, have, have had these moments. The greatest pleasures that we've had is when there was a challenge that we overcame, where there was something that we needed to create. It wasn't given to us, right? Imagine, right, and we all know this, right? A person who, who you know, sort of doesn't write their book, somebody gives them their book and they put their name on it, they don't enjoy it. They can't enjoy it. And they're deep in their heart. As a matter of fact, I'm sure it starts eating away at them because it's not theirs. Even though they get all the accolades, everybody loves your book, but they know inside they didn't create it. So by nature, our innate nature is a nature that will never enjoy in the long term anything that we have not created, anything that we have not earned. And therefore, when we think about ourselves, it's certainly true. And when we think about our children, it's, it's more importantly true. And this is true, again, whether it's about wealth or any, anything else in life. You have to know. And therefore, you know, it always comes back to, you want the best for your children? You have to make sure that they are able, that they are given the, the ability to create their own life, their own wealth, their own success. 
What does that mean? It'll look, it'll look different for every single person. What it doesn't look like, and this is for sure, like you said, when somebody is given a large sum of money for which they never worked and did not earn, and therefore they do not have to work the rest of, the rest of their lives, that is most likely not going to give them the pleasure of life. If they never have created and simply live the rest of their lives off money created by others, it's not that it's wrong because we don't have moral views on this. It's just that for your child, it won't allow them to have the most fulfilling life that they're meant to have. And interestingly, I know many people, you know, if it's just that, you know, trust fund babies, as they're called. I know some of them who've gone deeply into the spiritual world and are actually satisfied, not because of the money that they have, but because in addition to that, they've created their own world and life for themselves. I know many people who has caused, who's caused a tremendous amount of pain. And I'm sure we all know stories like this. And I think the second group is larger than the first group. And if you truly understand that it is a foundational rule of life, that nobody will ever be satisfied in life unless they have earned, unless they have created, then the question has to be not how much you give, in what ways you give, but how do I make sure in whatever way that I give, in whatever amount that I give to my children, or by the way, to anybody else, that it doesn't, by the way, I, I was having a conversation with somebody who's a partnership with his brother, and he's doing most of the work. The brother's doing almost none of the work, and they're splitting the profits 50-50. And I said, that's fine for now, and he's probably happy for now, but in the long term, that energy doesn't work. So back to children. The thought always has to be, I want my child to be the happiest child for the rest of their lives, not in the moment that they know they got they have their trust fund. And I know, and we've all seen, and it's a spiritual and, and physical rule, that unearned, un, an uncreative life is one that cannot and will not possibly bring fulfillment in the long term. So how do you set up a system, again, whatever the amount of money is, whatever the amount of time is, where you allow your child to have desire? And I think this is the key point. The one thing that you cannot give, but you can cause reasons for it to be diminished, is desire. Lack builds desire. If there's no lack, and lack doesn't have to be the fact they don't have food to eat, right? But it can be that there's a, a, a desire within them to do, to accomplish, to create. Unfortunately, too often, when you give bread of shame, which means when you give too much unearned, then the de desire becomes diminished. And then even if 30 years from now, they would want to do something because the desire was not allowed to flourish in the younger years, it can lead to them accomplishing, achieving, not just what they're meant to achieve in this world, but create in this world, and more importantly, enjoy this world. So it's a very, I think, I think rather than, which I think many parents look at, okay, I have all of this. Of course, I'm going to give it to my kids because I love them. The thought first has to be, I want my kids to be the happiest kids or have the happiest lives for the rest of their lives. I have to make sure I do not create a, a cycle of bread of shame because that almost never leads to pleasure, almost never leads to, to fulfillment. There's another really foundational spiritual principle that I learned in Kabbalah but then I kept finding whenever I looked at people in business and investing, and I wrote about it at some length in a chapter that I wrote about these two legendary hedge fund managers, Nick Sleep and Case Sicaria, because everything they did was really built on the concept of deferred gratification, that the ability to defer gratification turns out to be a kind of superpower. So they said they, would, they started to invest in companies like Amazon and Costco, which were, and Berkshire Hathaway, which, which were prepared to think in an incredibly long-term way. And so Amazon for years, every or everyone on Wall Street hated it because they didn't report any profits. They just would keep plowing their money back into the business to give their, their customers a better and better deal, more and more benefits through Prime Video or whatever else it was. And um, same thing with Costco, where they insisted on keeping their profit margins at something like 14%. They never would mark stuff up outrageously. And so they just kept taking really good care of their their company of, of their customers, and and what Nick and Zach said is, they they called this business model scale economies shared, and they said what it means is because these these companies benefit from their scale as they get bigger and bigger, um, they share those benefits with their customers, and so it becomes this kind of benevolent cycle. And I started to look at this in every area of life and to think, oh, that's amazing! This fundamental principle that we see in spirituality actually plays out in businesses. 
can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's, I, I don't know if I'm articulating it properly, but it, I, I kept seeing it in the Old Testament as well. Like, like you'd see, for example, the, the, the story of Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dream and seeing seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. So he advises Pharaoh to store surplus grain during the years of abundance. So again, it's an act of, of deferring gratification. Right. Interesting. So there's a fo foundational teaching in Kabbalah, which is that the way the world came into being is a process called simtsum. Simtsum is the ancient word translated as restriction, which means that in order for this world to come into being, there first had to be a restriction of the light, what we call the light of the creator, and then there was space. There was space for this world to come into being. Whereas before, the, everything was only light, there was no space for humanity. There was no place space for our work. That had to be created this empty blank canvas where we can create, where we can be born into, and so on. So it is seen that simtsum or restriction is the foundational uh, element in creation. Certainly, creation of anything important. And therefore, you know, my father would often use the example of the light bulb, where you need the you know the, the three what we call three columns, right? The one that receives the energy, the one that restricts the energy, and the one that allows the light to shine, and in order for any system to work, there has to be a receiving, there has to be giving, and there has to be a restriction. And when you understand that, that is foundational and fundamental to anything, certainly to the to, the, to our experience of life, but even to the creation of our world, it uh, gives you an understanding that in order for anything to prosper, it has to have this element. It goes a little bit back, when you think about it, to any business that we create, a person creates, he or she receives from it. Hopefully, he or she gives into it. And hopefully, within that system, there's also a process of restriction, or in your words, uh, uh, delayed gratification. The, only those three elements create a perfect system. And only those three elements can, can, can create a sustained system. And therefore, it's not coincidental in the, in the cases that you've shared, where when you have, I think most people know that you need to give into a business and take from a business. But what most people don't necessarily understand is that you need restriction in, in a business. In that delayed gratification or that ability to say, I won't take now so that I can take later. That is foundational and fundamental for any system. Not again, we, system can last for a day, for a week, for a month, or for five years. But for something to have an eternal ability to be self sustaining, there has to be that element of restriction. It's true both in large businesses, but it's also true in our own lives. In order, and, and again, there's many examples of this, but, but when we have, again, whether it's in our relationship, if we're taking all the time and we're not giving, that's not going to work. If we're taking and also giving but never restricting in our relationship, it also is not sustainable. Those three elements, sharing, receiving, and restriction, are foundational to any anything being having the ability to be sustainable. It, it's funny because I actually I actually quoted your father in this chapter because um I I should have shown this to you once uh, one day. It said um because I'm talking about these guys, um, Nick and Zach, and how everything they do basically is built on this idea of restriction on delayed gratification. And so I say, um, none of this is new. In the book of Genesis, Esau, a sucker for instant gratification, trades his precious birthright to his brother Jacob in return for a worthless bowl of lentil soup. By contrast, Jacob's son Joseph, a master of deferred gratification, has the foresight to set aside vast quantities of grain during the seven years of abundance ensuring that Egypt survives the seven years of famine that follow. Thousands of years later, we're presented over and over with this same choice between the present and the future, the instant and the deferred. And then a little bit later, I quote your father, Rav Berg, saying, instead of choosing the line of least resistance, the quick fix, instant gratification, the Kabbalist chooses the line of most resistance. Beautiful, beautiful, exactly. Because if you want the most abundance, you have to have the most resistance. And we know that you know, in simple terms, if you're if you're if you're you know, whether it's a bow and arrow, whether it's a catapult, the further back you pull, the further it will go, and that's the foundational spiritual teaching. So I I wanted to ask you one more thing about happiness because I I mean we we've talked a little bit about it already, and my my book and the podcast called Richer, Wiser, Happier, and and you've often struck me as one of the most consistently joyful people I've ever met. And I, I remember also in one of the books that you edited, a book of letters from Rav Brandwine, your father's teacher to your father, he wrote at one point, make sure always to be joyful. 
which struck me as an incredible thing. It was like, wait, you can actually always be joyful? How would you manage that? And so we talked about the importance of appreciation as being a central aspect of building a happy life. It seems to me also that one of the things you um, talk about a, a great deal is the importance of kindness. And the Rav would always say, you know, it's easy to become religious, but to become kind takes a lifetime. Can you talk about just the importance of kindness as, or anything else that you think is super central to building a truly happy life? Yes. Well, so I'll talk about both, with kindness and happiness. So so kindness, it's interesting. You know, I'm always in this, Monica and I have all often observed this, even in children, you'll have parents, high-achieving parents who want their children to be successful. But I am often shocked at how kindness is not at the top of that list. The reality is, the reason why it's important to be kind is because, as I said before, that energy that sustains the world, we call the light of the creator, is a kind of benevolent energy. If you're not in tune with that energy, you're never going to be happy because that's from, from where we receive all of our blessings and all of our abundance. So being kind, which simply means to be aligned with the force that sustains the world, that sustains the universe, is something that needs to be ingrained certainly within our children. And I am often shocked at good parents who are giving their children all the possibilities in life to be successful, but don't realize or don't remember or certainly don't ingrain within their children that kindness needs to be at the number one. Everything else can only flow from that. And second, as it relates to happiness, there's a section in the Zohar that says, and it says it's about King David, the biblical king, it says that whenever he would want to feel connected and he was sad, he would have somebody come in and play the harp or play a musical instrument and the music would bring him joy because he knew that what we call the light of the creator, that energy that brings abundance, only rests on a person who's happy. That's what it says, that the light of the creator only rests on an individual who's happy. So if you want to have abundance, you have to be happy. If you want to, to have blessings in your life, you have to be happy. And happiness, as we said before, flows from appreciation. But if you understand, you know, the, my father would often use this phrase in different ways, but he would say, it's dangerous not to be happy. Now, that might be overwhelming for some people, but the reality is, again, if you realize that, that blessings and light and abundance only rest on a person who's happy, and maybe some people are more inclined to it than others. Well, you definitely try to 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 use your time and your energies in how do I create for myself more happiness? Because that's what draws the next blessing. That's what draws the the, the next level of of abundance. And it ties back to what we said about appreciation. But it has to be. You know, I think some people, even spiritual people, don't often give enough weight to the importance of living a ha of of. Of, of, I don't want to use, use the word forcing yourself, but really encouraging yourself and do the things that are necessary to live a happy life because that's the only place, the only state upon which the blessings that uh, the light of the creator can rest. It seems like one of the biggest challenges is that we're, if, if, if we're in the mud, if we're in the world, if we're, you know, trying to um, make money, support our families, build businesses, you know, have an influence in the world, we get battered and buffeted a lot along the way. I mean, I, I you know, when I started studying Kabbalah maybe 15 years ago, the very first thing that happened, I got laid off by time right in the middle of the financial crisis when I was editing the European, Middle East, and African editions of time back in 2008. And I felt like absolutely crushed. And, you know, one of the big challenges is how, how to deal with these setbacks, these buffetings, these things where things don't seem to be going our way. And I, I, we all go through this, and if you could give us some sense of, uh, you know, how you've dealt with it, because I, you know, I know the Rav had a, a devastating stroke back in two thousand and four, and later, you know, maybe eight nine years later, passed away. Your your mom passed away a couple of years ago. Your your really beautiful son Josh was born with Down syndrome. You've you've gone through lots of challenging stuff that somehow you've managed to reframe or deal with in a way that's allowed you to maintain this happiness. And I wonder if you could just share with us how, how you do that in ways that we can emulate that might help us. Yes. So I think it stems from really the found, for me, the foundational element is the fact that I know that I am not directing my life. And that's a good thing. I think what happens too often is, is we think we are in total control. And when things don't go as we had wanted them, then then everything's, you know, a problem. But when we understand that we're basically a co-pilot in this journey of life, 
you know, call it God, call it the creator, call it the universe. But clearly, clearly, our plans, you know, my mother would often quote this, uh, quote would quote this, you know, man plans and God laughs, right? That sort of quote that she would often use. And that's true. I think every person who's lived more than a day knows that, I don't know, if the, you know what the percentages are, but 50% of our plans work out and 50% of them don't. We've also all experienced that sometimes when they don't work out, like you, you, you gave a few examples, they actually wind up for the betterment, right? That actually, I'm happy that that didn't happen. So it's really all about gaining that view of life. I am not in total control. I never was, never will be. There is a benevolent force, call it again, whatever force you want to call it, call it human, that is leading me in a positive direction. So much of our angst, anxiety, and upset comes from the fact that what I wanted to happen didn't happen. My view always, it happens to all of us. We all have plans, ideas, big ones, small ones that don't work out, that go in the, wrong, the other direction. My first thought is, there's a greater force involved in here, and I have certainty that it's going to lead me to a better place. That better place, by, and like, oh, the examples you've mentioned, whether it's the, the, the struggles with my parents and their health and their living in this world or with our son Josh and, and thousands of others that you and I, we've all had. My first thought is there's a greater force at work here, a benevolent force. I've seen it lead me to better places, even though, like I often use the example, and this is true, I think, of so many parents. If you asked me before Josh was born, do you want to have a son with Down syndrome? Of course, my answer would be absolutely not. If you ask me now, 21 years later, are you appreciative? Are you thankful that you had Josh with Down syndrome as a member of your, as your son and a member of your family? Absolutely, yes. The blessings that we've received, immeasurable. Myself, my wife, our kids, our community. So how silly is it that I would get upset when things don't go my way, when I've, see, I've experienced time and time again in life? I've had my plans and I've had what I wanted to happen. Sometimes they follow through and sometimes they don't. And when they don't, often I've seen them come to a better place. If you see life as the purpose of life isn't just to, you know, to, to stay above the sort of still waters and just get along, but to grow, sometimes growth comes from challenges and sometimes it comes from our, we ourselves pushing. But that mindset of change and growth, which is my desire, then the things that happen that you don't want to happen, you see them, you accept them as part of that greater plan, not to make you comfortable, but to make you grow. And I've both experienced that and used those experiences as, as the way I take in any new challenge that comes. Yes, not exactly what I would have planned for, not exactly what I would have wanted, but I've seen throughout life that these challenges often lead me to a better place. Sometimes they make me uncomfortable, but ultimately lead me to a better place. And, and that allows me to, to go through the challenges with a greater sense of peace, with a greater sense of acceptance. Yeah, and I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm much happier today, I think, than I was back in 2008 when I was working insanely 70, 80 hours a week managing a magazine, didn't have time to think. And I, you know, look, th that getting laid off led to all of these other things, whether it was initially ghostwriting books or then writing my own books and then having this podcast. And I also think there was some sense in which the crushing of my ego was very helpful because I was so busy going around the world, interviewing presidents and prime ministers and feeling like a big shot that I wasn't really open. I really did feel like my success was created by me. And once I got kind of smashed in a way that felt kind of unreasonable and unfair, it kind of, I had to sort of rebuild in a way that I, I never would have been as open to seeing how I needed to change, for example. So it, it did turn out to be the start of a really beautiful journey. Absolutely. And I'm, and I'm sure we've all had countless moments like that, but we don't often remember them when the next challenge comes. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, I'm aware that you have limited time. And, and I just wanted to know, is there, is there any last point you'd like to make something big that we failed to, to discuss? Oh, we've covered so much. I, I would say, I, I mean, I think we've covered so much of this. I would say that one of the most important teachings that I, I give this to that, that I always I don't know if the word is repeat, but one is that every single one of us is so much greater than we currently are and that often that we currently give ourselves credit for. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that every single one, I'll talk to myself even today as I sit there now, and you know, I would say I would accomplish certain things, you have to make a list, but my potential is 
endlessly greater than what it is currently now. And that drives me and it excites me and inspires me every single day, number one. And then the second one is that truly embracing the knowledge that the singular purpose for which I'm in this world is to have greater happiness, wealth, abundance every day, one day to the next. How do you achieve that? That's a whole other conversation. We've touched upon some of those points, but but to really understand that that's life as it is meant to be. That tomorrow I am happier today than today. I am more abundant tomorrow than today. And find let's find our ways to get there, but to know that that is the underlying purpose for which we're in this world. The, the other thing that I think for me has been hugely transformational when I look back on the last 15 years of studying this wisdom is something that that I got from your father where he, the Rav, where he would just would say over and over again, consciousness is everything. And that sense that my happiness was not going to come just externally from, you know, people thinking I was a big shot because I was editing an international magazine or because I was living in Belgravia or whatever, you know, this beautiful area of London, you know, it, it was going to have to be internal. And so I was going to have to work on my consciousness on, on these things like becoming kinder, becoming more loving, becoming more compassionate, more, more self-compassionate, you know, more sharing, treating other people with more human dignity. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be the external stuff that I'd been chasing really for the first 40 years of my life that was ever going to do the trick. Absolutely. And again, it's a very important fundamental teaching, which I think what I like about it, it's also logical. We know that what makes us happy or unhappy is not what is happening around us. You have two people in the same situation. I always use the example. There was a certain very wealthy billionaire. I remember reading the article maybe 20 years ago. He had lost almost all of his money. He was left with only $80 million. And the sort of the articles, I don't know if it was jokingly or not, said, how is he going to live only on $80 million? But of course, that man was terribly depressed. Well, you have somebody else who would have $80 million. He'd be the happiest person in the world, at least for that moment. Clearly, our situation does not make us happy or unhappy. It is how we view it, how what our consciousness is. And therefore, as my father would always remind us, consciousness is everything. If your consciousness is right, what, hap- what is happening around you is less important. If consciousness is wrong, what is happening around you is less important. As we said, two people in the same exact situation, one of them elated, one of them depressed. It is not the physical occurrences that usually make us make us happier and happier. It is how we receive them, what our consciousness is about them. And if I can end with a silly story. So and I, I often like repeating it because it goes really to this point. So years ago, a number of years ago, we were flying, flying from LA to New York. Uh, we were boarding the plane. I put my stuff in the overhead compartment. I'm sitting down. And, you know, people are filing by, going to their seats. And a woman had a very large, I think it's called Venti, a cup of Starbucks, one of the sweet ones. And she's trying to put her stuff in the overhead compartment, and she spills her coffee all over me. And my first thought is, oh, my God, for the next six hours of this flight, I'm going to have to, five hours of this flight, I'm going to have to sit in sticky clothes. The second thought I had was, well, but this is coming from the creator. This must be for your benefit. I don't understand exactly how, but it's definitely for your benefit. And I became instantly happy in that moment. I couldn't tell you the logical reason why I needed to spend the next five minutes, but I knew that there was a greater plan and that it was only for my benefit, that anything that happens and comes to my life is only for, only for my benefit. Consciousness, right? So I could have been uh, an angry person sitting there five and a half hours in a situation I couldn't change anyway and being angry at this woman who spilled her call family, or I could be a happy person sitting there in my stinky, in my, in my sticky clothes saying, I know this is for my benefit. Consciousness is everything. It's a beautiful note on which to end. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and thank, thank you, you for advising. being um, such a wonderful teacher over all these years. I, I've learned so much from you. And I, I often say that I learn more from you than I learned from going to college. So um, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. It's, uh, but of course, I didn't study very hard at college. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank see. you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been a real delight. Thank you so much. The key to improving yourself is not necessarily to do in one direction. But if you do things that make you more honest, more hardworking, that you take the proper diet, that you do the exercise, you do everything else, your whole body works to improve you. Like I mentioned, the chemicals that you have when you do good and when you do things right.